Hi, so yes, I'll be presenting our work, our paper on incremental inference for probabilistic programs. This is joint work with uh, Benny Bischel, Timon Gehr, Martin Vechev, and Vikash Mansinka. Can everyone hear? Okay. So probabilistic programming languages aim to make it easier to apply probabilistic modeling and inference techniques by providing higher level abstractions for working with uncertain knowledge. And this is a popular area now. Uh, there's a lot of programming languages shown here, but this list is also rapidly expanding. So one of the core ideas behind a lot of recent work in probabilistic programming is that probabilistic models can be represented simply by regular programs that also make random choices. In other words, that sample random numbers. However, inference in probabilistic programs uh, remains a very difficult problem. Even inference in more classical probabilistic modeling frameworks like Bayesian networks can be very difficult. And the problems only become more difficult when we uh, deal with probabilistic programs. So different probabilistic programming systems have taken different approaches to inference. Some use dynamic approaches, which are based on sampling execution histories of probabilistic programs. Others use static approaches, like symbolic analysis. Um, also, some approaches present an interface, which is essentially that of a solver, where the user just asks inference to be done, and the system does inference. Others may provide more customizable inference uh, to varying levels, as we'll see later in the session. So this talk is concerned with making dynamic or sampling-based inference more efficient. So in dynamic sampling-based inference, we start with a probabilistic program, we apply an inference algorithm, and the algorithm gives us a set of samples. And I'll explain what a sample is later, but these essentially characterize the distribution represented, they characterize the probability distribution represented by the program. So this paper is concerned with the setting where we have two probabilistic programs, P on the left and Q on the right, and they're somehow related. And we suppose that we've already done inference for the problem on the left, and we've obtained a collection of samples. The question is, can we somehow convert those samples directly into samples for the other program, Q, on the right, without having to do inference from scratch, which would be in a very expensive operation? So I'll jump into some probabilistic programming, uh, more detail about probabilistic programming. <coughs> So here's a simple probabilistic program. Uh, what distinguishes a probabilistic program from a regular program is that it's meant to define a probability, probability distribution on its executions. And it does that using two language constructs. One is the ability to sample random choices. So this flip right here takes a parameter, 0 0.02, and returns the value 1 with probability 0 0.02. Otherwise, it returns the value 0. In addition to the ability to make random choices, probabilistic programs can contain constraints here at the bottom. And these basically are constraints on the execution, which observe that some event holds. Um, and the role of these constraints is to basically rule out some executions of the program that don't satisfy the constraint, and then redistribute the probability among those executions that do satisfy. And in this work, we assume that constraints take the form of observing that some random choice takes a given value. So this is a specific type of constraint that we consider. So we formalize the notion of an execution by defining what we call a trace, which basically just contains the values for every random choice in the execution. So this program on the left contains four, uh, has four possible execution traces. T1, T2, T3, and T4 for the four possible assignments to the random choices up here. And we don't consider this random choice in the observed to be in the trace because it's actually deterministically set by the observed statement. So together, these random choices and observes uh, define a probability distribution on traces of the program. And for example, we can compute this distribution by evaluating the probability of this trace. We just take the product over the probabilities of every individual random choice. So here, burglar is 0. And the probability that that would have happened is 0.98. And we also multiply by the probability of alarm being 0, which given that burglar was 0, is 0.99. And then finally, we incorporate the probability of any observations at the end. And then we normalize this distribution. And 
here we have a probability distribution on traces. So one thing we might want to do with a probabilistic program is compute the probability of some other event A occurring. So we can think of A as some assertion, and we're asking, what's the prob probability that the assertion will hold under the distribution that we just defined? So an example could be, what's the probability that burglary is one? And one way we could compute this is by enumerating over all the traces in which this event is true and just adding their probability. However, there's typically too many traces in order to enumerate them. Uh, so we focus on sampling-based approaches. And here, we sample some number of traces from the program's distribution. And then for each trace, we evaluate whether the event is true and then form an estimate of the probability that the event is true. And the focus of sampling-based inference and probabilistic programs and this paper is around more efficient methods for sampling traces from this distribution. So here are two programs. P is our original program on the left, and Q is a different program. And these two programs are related because, well, it looks like somehow this is using the name intruder, whereas this one was using the name burglary. Uh, also, it looks like this one's using the name siren, whereas this one was using the name alarm. And then finally, this program on the right introduced some new random choice called earthquake. And earthquake, if, if, if it's one, then it changes the probability of the other random choices. But if it's zero, then the probabilities of the other random choices don't really change. And also, earthquake is a very low probability event with only probability 0 0.005. So intuitively, it looks like these two programs are related somehow. So our question is, can we uh, somehow, if we're able to sample traces for the program on the left, can we somehow convert them to traces of the program on the right, since these two programs are so closely related? And the way we do this is by uh, translating one trace at a time using what we call a trace translator. So there's a large design space for trace translators. <coughs> Um, but the approach we take is to assume that there's a semantic correspondence between the random choices. And then not all choices may be in semantic correspondence. So there may be choices in P that don't exist and uh, all have any corresponding choice, as well as choices in Q. So in this case, earthquake does not have a correspondence. So we call that a new random choice. So to translate a trace, we just take the existing trace over here. So suppose we had uh, zero for burglary and one for alarm. We simply copy the values into the, through the correspondence. And then we sample the new choices from some distribution. So here we happen to get a zero. So that's the general framework, but that leaves open some questions. So one is, how do we define a correspondence between random choices and two probabilistic programs? Second one is, from what distribution do we sample new random choices, like earthquake? And then as we'll see, the, when we apply this procedure, the actual trace that we get from Q is not actually sampled from the distribution we, we wanted. So we'll need some way of correcting for that difference in order to uh, have accuracy guarantees. So first, uh, talking about how to define a correspondence. Well, since a correspondence is, term, is, is a mapping between these random choices, we first need to uniquely name each random choice within a given execution. Um, and this notion of naming schemes for random choices doesn't usually affect the semantics of, of probabilistic programming languages but it does affect uh, trace-based inference implementations. And there's some existing work discussing how, how, how the implementation names random choices internally actually uh, can affect the efficiency of MCMC inference. So this also affects our work. Um, so here's one option. We could try to use variable names in the program. So these are the variable names on the left. Um, and that works in this program, but some probabilistic programming languages you know, may not have, may not give variable names to every random choice. And also, if the language has multiple assignment, these won't be unique names. We could also try to use a structural location using the AST. So for the first random choice, we could say that this is part of statement one on the right-hand side. Uh, this is part of statement four in the condition. So this seems reasonable, but this, even this isn't always optimal, because here, I moved this intruder random choice I basically copied it and put it separately in each branch. So although this is semantically very similar program, basically the same, uh, now this random choice no longer has a consistent name. So this question of how to name random choices in probabilistic programs is an interesting area, and how to infer naming schemes is an interesting area, but we don't really try to solve that problem automatically. Uh, we assume that some naming scheme has been provided. 
So given a naming scheme, we then can establish a correspondence, which is essentially a bijection between some subset of names of choices in one program and some subset of names of choices in the other program. And there's some requirements that this correspondence should have. Uh, the corresponding choices should have the same support, and they should be existentially co consistent. And this essentially means that our trace translation procedure, which I'll talk about later, it doesn't crash. Okay, so going back to our two programs here, uh, in this setting, defining the correspondence wasn't very difficult, or at least we can, we can posit that this is a reasonable correspondence. We represent this as a mapping C from names in Q to names in P. Okay, and also in this work, there's, uh, we basically assume that we are provided with a semantic correspondence. And this is also another interesting area for future work uh, in basically inferring what are good semantic correspondences from two programs. This can be done in some cases by using a, an edit in the AST if you name random choices based on the AST, or maybe there's other approaches that could be used as well. Um, but again, this is not the focus of our paper. So we assume that a semantic correspondence is given. So one question we have is, well, when is a, when is, what makes a good semantic correspondence between two probabilistic programs? The way we define this is as a difference in probability distributions between the two programs. However, in order to compare the two programs, we first need to sort of map them onto the same space. So on the left, these are all, this is the distribution represented by program P. So each trace has some probability. However, traces of program Q have, um, there's, there's eight possible traces, right? Because it has three random choices. So we can't directly compare those. So to compare them, we have to first project each trace of Q onto just the corresponding random choices. Then now we have four partial traces of Q. And there's some probability distribution that, that, is, uh, that Q defines on those partial traces. So now we can compare these two distributions directly. And there's very, various ways of measuring the difference between two probability distributions. Here we're using uh, this kublock leibler divergence. And this basically says that the probabilistic semantics between the two programs using the correspondence to map between them, it should be small. So for example, for these two programs, these are the two distributions, and the divergence is small, 0 0.01. And here we're editing program Q by changing this constant. So we're increasing the probability of earthquake from 0 0.005 to 0.5. So it's a relatively small syntactic change. Um, but that has changed the distribution of Q significantly, right? So now the KL divergence has gone up by 100 times, and this would no longer be very close uh, probabilistic semantics for the two programs. So small syntactic or numeric changes in the programs can have a big impact on, on these probabilistic semantics. Okay, so that's sort of the notion of a semantic correspondence and what makes one good or not. Uh, the second problem we had was actually how do we sample new random choices to fill in the trace. So there's different options here. Uh, we took in this work a baseline approach where we just evaluate the random choice expression in the original program. So here we'd sample earthquake with probability 0 0.005. This isn't the optimal uh, choice in general. And there is, so, so for example, the optimal choice would be sampling with 0.115 probability. So there's interesting future work in um, actually sampling these new random choices from the optimal distribution, which is possible in certain cases. Okay, so now we've defined this procedure for how we generate a new trace. In general, this procedure is not going to actually sample from the distribution we wanted. So how do we correct for that difference? Well, again, this difference can be caused by two things. One would be the different semantics between the corresponding choices, and the other one would be the suboptimal sampling of new choices. So our solution is to use work uh, basically draw on important sampling ideas from, from statistics, and we compute an importance weight W. And this allows us to use existing theory to give asymptotic convergence guarantees for an incremental inference algorithm. It says that as we uh, translate a large number of traces and generate a weighted collection of traces of P uh, uh, of the next program Q, then that should give us the same result as if we had generated these traces directly from Q. And however, there's sort of no free lunch because the efficiency of the approach actually depends on the difference of the magnitude of the difference between the two distributions. So this is a key point um, in that this incremental inference approach really depends on the actual probabilistic semantics of the two programs already being relatively close. 
So just to give a sense of the implementation strategy, here's a very lightweight implementation strategy of, of a trace translator. So I'm starting with a trace of the program on the left, trace of program P, and we're going to produce a trace of program Q using this correspondence C in the middle. So the first step is we execute a transformed version of Q. Um, and we do this by visiting each random choice, and we test first whether the, address, whether the name of this random choice is in the correspondence. If it's not, then we sample it. If it is in the correspondence, we deterministically draw the value from the other trace. And then we return that value deterministically to the state of the program. Uh, at each step, we also, when we find a corresponding choice, we increment a score down here with the log probability of the choice. When we reach an observed statement, that also causes the score to be incremented. So after running Q, we can run P, where we visit each statement. And each time we hit a random choice, we also increment a score for corresponding random choices. Uh, this is a deterministic execution over here because the trace was already fully provided. And also we score observes. So finally, now we have produced this trace Q, we can produce this log importance weight that we need for important sampling by taking the difference of these two scores. So this is a, a very lightweight strategy that involves executing both programs end to end. Um, there are also more incremental approaches that can be used in certain cases, and we discuss a little bit about that in the paper. So there's different types of applications of, of this incremental inference approach. Um, one class is that sort of Q could arise naturally from editing P. So this could be when we change observations or give new observations to the program or it could be when we're doing local search of our programs as part of a learning procedure, for example. Um, and the second type of application is when we actually construct P intentionally to facilitate inference in Q. And this is the case. This is useful basically when P, and P is very semantically similar to Q, but for some reason easier to solve intrinsically. So as an example of the second class, here's a hidden Markov model. So on the right, we have a second order hidden Markov model. And we have these hidden states here, where each hidden state depends on the previous two hidden states. So xi minus 1 and xi minus 2. On the left is a simplified model, which is a first order Markov model, where each hidden state depends just on the previous hidden state xi minus 1. So exact inference in this first order model is significantly easier than exact inference in the second order model, because of the different data flow dependencies. So the idea is we're going to use incremental inference, where we first do inference in the first order model, and then we translate those traces into the second order model. So we apply this to a text data set, where we have the hidden state of the hidden Markov model is the original text. The observed state is some text that was corrupted with typos. And the goal is to infer the uncorrupted text given the corrupted text. So we applied our incremental inference approach. Um, and we compared it against an MCMC algorithm, which does Gibbs sampling in the second order Markov model from scratch. And here we have x-axis is the runtime to obtain an inference, y-axis is the rough accuracy, uh, a sense of accuracy of the, of the inference. And we see that the incremental approach uh, outperforms MCMC by being in this upper left-hand corner. And also, it's important to note that the weighting that we, the weighting that we do is actually important for achieving the highest accuracy. Uh, here's another qualitative example of the approach applied to image understanding. So here on the left, I have a probabilistic program that first samples the parameters of some letter. This includes its location, its font size, its rotation angle, as well as uh, whether it's an A, B, or C. Then we render the letter here. So if we run this segment of the program, we would generate these stochastically generated images. What we do is we then observe that a noisy version of the image is, is some image we, we have from the real world. And we try to infer these parts of the program execution. So what, what, were the, what letter was it and where was it and so on. So inference in this program is actually uh, challenging. So here on the left, we have an observed image. And we just ran a simple Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And it sort of gets stuck at this local minimum here. Uh, so this C sort of fits with the, part of the, the bottom part of the B and gets stuck. And basically, this inference algorithm is never going to converge, uh, essentially, in any reasonable amount of time. So here we have a modified program Q, uh, P, where we've just added this one statement where we've added some Gaussian blur. And uh, 
this builds on existing work. This technique has been known, you know, in the uh, in image understanding literature before, but this is, is an interesting example of incremental inference in probabilistic programs. So if we add blur, basically now the program would generate images like this. But so this program is semantically very similar to the other program, but actually turns out inference is a lot easier. So here's the observed image again, and now when we run inference, uh, we no longer get stuck in that minimum. We're able to jump out and uh, and get closer to the, the correct posterior distribution, which essentially in this in this example is a very tiny uh, mode. And at some point, we then translate these traces to the original unblurred program that just happened, and then we just tweak it a little bit afterwards. Okay, so this, there's a lot of future work to build on this framework. Um, like I said, we're sampling these new or non-corresponding random choices from this default baseline, but there's actually existing work which we can combine to uh, do the optimal choice there in some cases. Also, the question of how to automatically infer naming schemes for probabilistic programs is relevant for inference efficiency, as well as automatically inferring semantic correspondences. And finally, there's other types of trace translators that don't just have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, there's related work in this area, uh, included existing work on using sequential Monte Carlo for probabilistic programs. And most of this work can be seen, uh, a lot of this work can be seen as a special case of our approach, where they just are adding statements to the end of the program, whereas we're able to handle more general changes or differences between programs. Uh, there's also been work on, well, our work builds on a lot of theory that was built in computational statistics or for sequential Monte Carlo. And there's also been work on incremental exact inference, both in probabilistic programs and in more classical probabilistic graphical models. So to summarize, we've uh, introduced a framework for incremental sampling-based inference in probabilistic programs. And the difference in probabilistic semantics between the two programs is very important for the uh, incremental inference to provide efficiency gain. And there's lots of room for using different types of program analysis to uh, improve on the work. Thank you. Hi, so my question is, can uh, using, using your system, does it include uh, observing real valued random variables, as was suggested in your image example? Right, so for real valued random variables, um, so form the formalism, we didn't really develop the real valued continuous distribution case uh, formally in the paper. We just focused on the conceptual idea, basically, and discrete random variables for that. Uh, however, you you know, you can, the technique can be applied and extended uh, and still works in the continuous value case. But yeah, we haven't formally worked that out in the paper. But there's been other work using continuous random variables and probabilistic programs. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so in particular, if, if my program doesn't just sample a trace, if it samples like a weighted trace, I can still apply this, this technique? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Chan from CMU. So you say that in, in, the, in the talk that so the difference between the P and Q, the semantic of P and Q is very important. But I'm curious that so you say that so the difference should be small. So I'm curious that so how do you verify or certify that so it is small enough? <laughs> right. For example, for the, the event in the program such so that the event is a uh, real uh, event. So that means the probability yeah, of the event is very, very small or tiny. So. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so basically verifying or measuring this difference in semantics is itself a very hard problem. And um, there are some heuristics that, that have been developed actually in computational statistics for detecting when to distribute, when you're, uh, when, this, when, these, when this difference may be really bad. But these are actually heuristics really. So there's not many uh, great guarantees we can give, actually. Okay. But so, yeah. so that means that you don't have uh, any formal uh, approach to verify that. Right? Um, right, and actually verifying that is probably, or it seems like that is as hard of a problem as doing inference in program Q itself, actually. Okay, yeah. okay thank you.
Jan Hoffman, Carnegie Mellon. Um, related question, a bit broader. Um, so there, there are a lot of things going on to to make this method work. So um, if I, you know, would say like, well, I'm not so sure if like the samples I get at the end of the day are sound. So what can you tell me to kind of like make, feel, make me feel confident that that this all works out? Right. Um, well, there's I guess the higher highest level sort of way of validating this any sort of inference algorithm. Uh, is you know testing its predictive ability maybe on held out data that would be something that's uh, a technique which applies to various machine learning methods including this one um, and then actually the, the question of testing the accuracy of inference algorithms is, is also an open area of research uh, and yeah that's it's a very difficult problem so but but there are some heuristics out there and it's but it is, there's no like clean formal uh, techniques at the moment that I, th that I know of